say that in addition to being an, a great expert on video games and a wonderful curator to work with and endlessly responsive, he's a wonderful teacher. Um, I might have to confess here that my video game experience was a little limited before I met Chris. It's taken a dramatic turn for the better now, and he has been unfailingly encouraging, not just to me, but to everyone on our staff, to bring us into the project and make us feel part of it. And uh, gosh, I never thought I would be downloading World of Warcraft on my home computer, but there it is. So uh, thank you, Chris, for all that you've done to sort of make good on the promise of Wayne Clough's first Smithsonian 2.0 conference. With that, I'd like to introduce Chris. Well, hello. Um, so Betsy, thank you very much for that very gracious introduction. And uh, you know, again, to the staff at the museum, it has been an absolute honor to have been able to work on this project with the Smithsonian. Um, the staff has been uh, incredibly accommodating. You know, when uh, when we first started discussing how we can find the intersection of technology and new audiences and a new way of a museum like the Smithsonian reaching out and speaking to a world that is you know, increasingly connected day by day, that is reaching out and having a global voice and a global discussion. You know, it wasn't this uh, exhibition that you're about to experience wasn't the first idea. They said, hey, can you come in and let's talk through some things. We have about 30 minutes in Betsy's schedule, so if you could pr prepare something, that's fine. Now, I'm not known for brevity. Um, as anyone that knows me will attest, and doubly so when I'm particularly passionate about something. So that 30-minute meeting took about three hours, literally, and uh, we came with all these great ideas about doing a bunch of different things. They said, wow, that's great, but we need you to do this because this is the first time we've ever experienced this. So they helped me to be able to tell a better story, um, a story that I've been living with since I was a child. I grew up in the 1970s. I was actually born April 2nd, 1970, and I am of a generation that I have labeled the bit babies because we were the first kids that grew up with computers in the home. We were the first ones that understood that there was more to these machines. There was more uh, that they could offer the experience, the stories we wanted to tell, um, a, 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 uh, a world in which we were able to kind of project our aspirations to examine who we are. And it was one of these things where, by and large, most parents of that era went, I have no idea what these confusers are for, and you're wasting your time. You should go get some fresh air, and ATMs are about as far as we're ever going to go. But those of us that grew up in that era understood that um, there was more happening behind the glass than we could express. Right? We were young, and we did not have the vocabulary yet to accurately describe what it is that we were feeling. So it is my opinion that this exhibition could not have happened at any other point in history than right now. And for the very simple reason that those of us that grew up as bit babies are now raising children of our own. So I will be 42 in April, I have three children, and we play games together on an almost daily basis inside of my home. Now, not as through as many machines anymore since so many of them are here at the Smithsonian for a while and I just realized I won't get most of them back until my oldest uh, daughter finishes her first semester in college, which is quite eye-opening to me personally. Um, but what I would like to share with you and then we'll open it up for, for discussion and questions, um, I'd like to share with you the text that will greet you when you enter the exhibition. Christmas 1980 was the year that I received a gift of untold mystery and excitement that would ultimately chart the trajectory for my future career, a Commodore VIC-20. This amazing little device was able to transport me to worlds beyond my dreams, worlds that I could create, control, and type into existence. Learning to program that little machine opened up a fascinating world and a love for science, storytelling, and art. The short yet prolific 40-year history of video games offers some of the deepest personal and globally connecting experiences in human history. Of course, many games never aspire to be anything more than an adrenaline pump where high scores rule and the loosest of stories hold the game together. The common thread, regardless of intent, is that they are an amalgam 
of disciplines, storytelling, animation, music, and cinematography, whose sum is greater than its parts. This defines a new art medium that is beyond traditional definitions used in the fine art world. I find this fascinating and truly inspiring. Using the cultural lens of an art museum, viewers can determine whether the games on display are indeed worthy of the title art. Some visitors will encounter a game that transports them back to their childhood or gain insight into how these games were made. My hope is that the people will leave the exhibition with an understanding that video games are so much more than what they first thought. They may even be art. And, uh, you know, that succinctly sums up my, my feeling as we go into this. This has been uh, an incredibly rewarding life experience for me. While it's been three years I've had the privilege of working with this team at the museum, I've been waiting my entire life for this moment. And so uh, I thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to come and, and talk to us today and to experience what is not only personal for me, but for so many of us that grew up understanding that these games, these computers, these worlds had more to teach us about ourselves than we first thought. So with that, I thank you very much. Okay. So we'd like to answer any questions that people may have. Yes. Yes. Very good question. Um, we, I think we're, so the, the question is, part of the narrative that we've described for this exhibition is that it is the, in playing the game that games become art. And to such a large degree that this is believed by the public at large who engages in this activity, they believe that they actually own, they have a right of ownership of not only the gameplay, but of the materials within the game, the characters, the experiences. This is part of, of them appropriating it into their lives. I think there are two separate components to this. The first is the participation of the player within the game that creates art is separate from one owning it. So allow me to explain. I believe that there are three voices in video games. The first voice is that of a designer, of an author, of a poet. Somebody who wants to deliver a message to the world and has chosen this medium in which to express that message. The second voice in games is that of the game itself, the, the, literally the mechanics of the game, how you are to interact with it, how you are to approach what it is trying to tell you. It communicates this to you through these mechanics. But that third voice is the player. Because what video games allow you to do is it allows you to keep the authority of an author. They'll start you at the beginning of a story, they will end you where they want to end you, but along that arc, you're able to explore and provide your own personal experience to the storyline that takes you there. So I think, to your question, there are two separate components to this. Whether or not the public or the players can actually own those and appropriate them says a lot for what it is they're trying to achieve. Right? Um, I think they're two separate components. The three pieces that we talk about here do not include, I think, that fourth, which is ownership. That you may need to speak to the creators about. Yes. Right. So the question is, with these games, some games taking 80, 100, even, you know, 200 hours, depending on what you're playing, if anyone is a Skyrim fan, um, uh, how do we capture the essence of these games? The goal isn't to uh, capture the games in their entirety. What we're doing with the materials in this exhibition is we are peeling back the gameplay veneer. We're pulling back what you just see presented on the surface to better describe what the intent was of the designers 
of the environments, of the artists, of the story. So the goal here isn't to allow you to fully experience the depth of a Mass Effect 2 or Attack of the Mutant Camels, if you remember that on the Commodore 64. The goal here is to describe intent and to demonstrate how those voices play into the experience that you can then enjoy, right, in your life. I mean, and there's a reason for that, right? We had um, one reporter who was in here who spent four and a half hours going through all of the, the uh, materials within the exhibition. So if we were to make it any more expensive than that, we would require you to take residence in the museum, and I'm not sure if that's policy for the museum, so. Yes, any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, when the earliest game creators, did they consider what they were doing to be art? Um, I think it's interesting. It depends on who you speak to. It depends on what they were trying to actually achieve in, in the games that they created. I find it uh, fascinating that when we look at art in a general sense, and I do not have an art background, right? I have game background. Um, I find it interesting that people who necessarily label themselves artists don't necessarily get to define whether or not their work is actually art. That is left up to the people who understand the message that they are trying to convey, who appropriate that, who find personal connection with it. It is at that point that art is achieved because you're finding resonance within someone else's message. So to that end, I think a lot of the earlier game developers looked at the work that they were trying to build, the stories they were trying to tell. They were no less ambitious than the games and the stories that we have today. The problem was they were limited by what the technology allowed them to do. And so we are left with a more abstract notion of their idea, right? An abstract notion of their narrative, which is why in the very earliest games, they used to include supplemental materials like beautiful hand-drawn box art or comics that describe this epic battle that you were about to go ahead and engage in. And then the game would turn on and there would be a block in the middle of the screen with a little arrow. And that was supposed to represent the warrior in this epic battle that you were going to spend, you know, massive amounts of time in. It is literally the limitation of technology. And so while I think many of them may not have considered it to be art in the traditional sense, I think most people who engaged in the development of games from the earliest points on knew it was more than they could describe. Please. That's right. That's right. And so they were no, to your point, they were no less important. It's just the vocabulary was limited. And that's why I said before, we could not have had this exhibition at any other point in time until now. Because not only were the ones that grew up doing this at, or an age where we can describe it, we now have a stronger vocabulary in which to explain why we believe it to be art. Why we believe it to be more important than people generally, uh, you know, give it credit at first blush. Yes. So the question was, why are, uh, why is it important for people who did not grow up in that era or have kids or grandchildren come to visit this exhibition? Because I believe video games played such an important cultural role in America in the era in which they grew up. 
Consider the fact that before 1970, the notion of a computer typically meant these very large, you know, looming installations that only scientists and military had access to. Who would have predicted today that through this device, I could reach out around the world and speak to a global citizenry, right? There's never been another point in human history where an individual has as much reach as they do. Right? It's not about a printing press and, and printed word. It's a webcam and access to the internet. It's democratization of technology that has allowed this to occur. And video games play an incredibly important and critical role in the evolution of the technology and how we use it in society. And one of the things that video games can do is allow us to explore worlds that are not of our own world. They are, it's a vast, endless opportunity of galaxies and universe and story and content and self-reflection and social reflection that takes place within so many of these games. And so that is my hope, is that even people who did not grow up with these games can come in with an open mind and understand that perhaps there were more to these games than we first believed. Thank you. Yes. Right, so the question was, was the exhibition designed more towards the general public viewership or the gaming audience? It's interesting, uh, growing up as somebody who played video games, wrote video games, uh, you know, uh, designed these things for my own pleasure, to call myself a gamer does not exclude the rest of the public. In the United States today, the average age of a video game player is 37 years old. The largest segment of game players on the internet in the United States are women over the age of 35. The term gamer has taken a very different turn in the past decade. So this exhibition is open not only to the people who have invested a tremendous amount of time in gameplay, game theory, and design, but to anyone who's ever been delighted, inspired, or touched by a game that they've played. So we're all gamers to an extent, to a very large extent, and this exhibition is made for all of us. Yes. Well, um, so does this, so the question is, does this exhibition look at the next phase of this as interactive art? Is that the question? Um, I believe that is another evolutionary track that video games can take because, again, it is in the playing of the game, it is in the participation of the player, their imagination, and their ability to create that, again, makes video games art. One of the games you mentioned, Minecraft, is one of the games that's actually in the exhibition. And this is a game where it is entirely open to the player to take these rudimentary objects and build whatever they desire. From models of the Sistine Chapel to the, you know, the USS Enterprise, it all exists within this virtual world of creation and inspired work. And so I do believe that video games are going to usher in this new renaissance of creativity, of personal expression and of global communication in a way that we have not seen in the prior 40 years. You wanna go take a look? I'm walking with these guys right here. Any other questions? No? Oh, one more. Sports games, specifically? Oh, I'm sorry, say it one more time. Do you see massive multiplayer games? Oh, eSports games. Um, eSports games as in? Mm -hmm. Again, the, so the question are eSports games, are they, uh, can they be classified as art? And again, I believe that that is up to the observer to decide as to whether or not they believe it to be art. There is certainly social reflection in some of those games. There is certainly a, a specific worldview that some of those games represent. There are artists and designers, 
there are storytellers and poets that are trying to speak to us through this medium. And again, while I said we now have the vocabulary to start describing this, it's still a nascent art form. It's only 40 years old. Only 40 years. Consider the fact that video games are not only one of the most expressive forms of art that we have at our disposal in society, it is the youngest, and it is one in which the creators are still with us. We can't say that about any other form of media. Television, radio, music, printed word, painting. So it, I believe it's our responsibility as society, not, I don't speak on behalf of the museum, of course, from a social perspective, somebody who engages in this, it is, I believe, society's responsibility to protect and to nurture this nascent form because it is the most expressive. So yes, you can have very artful games that exist within the eSports space. You can have games with uh, important meaning in them. Whether or not they can truly be art, I leave to you. You wanna go? Who wants to go? Let's go. Thank you everyone for your time.